From the Youth Science Council, this is Good Question, a podcast about science in the UAE. I'm your host, Sada Shirbeji. Today, we're talking to Dr. Aisha Eswedi, professor of earth sciences at Khalifa University. The majority of her research is focused on Mesozoic strata in Argentina, North America, and the UAE. She also manages geochemistry in ancient and modern environments lab focused on biomarkers and stable isotopes. Don't worry, she'll be explaining what these terms mean throughout the episode. We'll be having a really important conversation on climate science and setting the tone for that conversation by introducing background concepts in geology. By the end of this conversation, you should have some idea on how you can contribute by doing your part to improve our climate today. Welcome to the show, Dr. Aisha. It's good to have you here. Thanks for having me. Let's start with introducing you. You know best, so tell us a little bit about you. So I'm Aisha al Uh I'm a professor, associate professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at Khalifa University of Science and Technology in Abu Dhabi. I am a geochemist by training uh, and a geologist. And I studied at the University of Oxford for my PhD. I was at the University of Kansas for my master's. And my undergraduate, which was not in geology, but environmental science, was at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. And before that, I was here in Abu Dhabi. And that's where I did most of my uh, primary education up to high school. Mashallah. Uh, can we get some knowledge on some of these words that you dropped? Like, what is geology? What is geochemistry? And how did how is that different from geography? Okay. So when I was growing up, and I'll maybe explain why I became <laughs> geologist first. Yeah. Because that's a bit easier. Uh, my parents made us watch a lot of documentaries, David yeah. Attenborough documentaries. Yeah. So we were exposed to documentaries a lot. We were taking camping. We spent a lot of time outside. And we spent a lot of time basically looking at the natural world and both geography and geology, the word geo relates to the earth. Mm. And those words are about the natural earth. So the word geology is basically the study of the earth, ology being the study of something and geo being earth. Yeah. Where geography, on the other hand, is not just studying the earth, but it's really studying just the outside, the thinnest layer of the earth, which is the layer that we live on. So it's the processes of mountain buildings, um, of rivers flowing, the directions that they flow, and then how humans interact with that landscape. So in many ways, the subjects of geology and geography are interrelated. Mm. And so today, many geology and geography departments are united together and they work together because those fields are so related. But within geography are also aspects of um, humans and how humans interact with the earth, which geology doesn't really deal with. Mm. Geology does deal with um, organisms and how organisms living on the planet have changed through time and how the ecosystems have changed through time. But it doesn't really address how humans interact with the earth over time. And that has changed. Um, and maybe we can talk about that a bit later if we can talk about the Anthropocene a little bit um, and how humans have impacted the earth and how geologists are viewing that. Um, but for the most part, Geology and what I do is field-based geology. So I spend a lot of time outdoors collecting hundreds of kilos of rocks <laughs> to try and understand how the earth was hundreds of million years ago. Yeah. Um, 200 million years ago mostly is the time that I study. And I study that using chemistry. And so we call the chemistry which is integrated into geology geochemistry. So the chemistry of the earth. And what I look at is the chemistry of natural systems. I look at carbon isotopes primarily. Um, and carbon isotopes are effectively just different uh, masses of carbon that we can use to tell us a bit about what's happening on the planet. Whether we see, when we talk about climate change today, we talk about perturbation of carbon, that there's a big increase in carbon and that that carbon is coming from fossil fuels. And carbon isotopes are just fingerprints of that carbon. And so it's a slightly different type of carbon than the normal background carbon that we have in the atmosphere. So obviously we breathe out carbon dioxide and plants take in carbon dioxide. And that carbon has a very specific fingerprint, which is captured in rocks when plants die and when animals die, when we die, that carbon stays with us. And so that's what I study to try and understand how carbon has changed in the environment, in the atmosphere through time specifically in deep time, so very, very long time ago, 
um, and to try and understand what the impact was of that carbon change. Did it increase the temperature? Did it decrease the temperature? Did it affect life on Earth? Did it affect the oceans? How did it affect the oceans? Um, and then trying to understand how long it took the Earth to recover, which is a big question today if we start to think about, okay, well, we think there's this huge increase in carbon into the atmosphere today driven by fossil fuels. Um, and those fossil fuels all come from rocks, which are very, very old, <laughs> mostly 150 million years old, 200 million years old, and even older. Um, and that carbon has a very different fingerprint to the carbon which exists in the background today. Mm. So this carbon helps establish a timeline. Yeah. And this is what you use in order to get an idea of what happened in the past. Yeah. And from what I gather of what you said, um, the changes that occur um, due to humans is not so much a part of geology until today, because now we, I, I'm sure in, in this grand scheme of things, the interactions that human have, humans have with the earth is really small, isn't it? Yeah. So when we think about the earth, we can think about humans as being kind of gardeners on the top layer, mm. right? And then you have people who study dinosaurs and they're people who basically have big diggers and they dig very, very deep into the earth. And yeah. the deeper down you go, the deeper you're digging. Yeah. Um, and if you think that we're just gardeners on the top of the planet, mm. then our interactions with plants and with rocks and with soil and with the sea, um, with life on this planet is visible today, right? We, we don't see it in deep time. Mm. Um, we don't see it, you know, if we start to look beneath the sediment, beneath the earth, and we start to go down hundreds of meters, we don't see evidence of humans. Mm. Um, we do see it very shallow on this kind of thin lithosphere, this, the thinnest part of the earth, the very top part. Um, and humans, obviously we have to burn fossil fuels. We burn wood, we burn coal to get fire, to get food mm. for yeah. our homes. Yeah. We interact with plants, we interact with animals because we eat them. Um, and in order to sustain the large population we have on this planet, which has been growing over time, we have to manipulate our environment. And that manipulation of the environment and the, the um, basically changes and modernization and increase in the number of things that we use, tools that we use that burn fuels is what really causes these changes in our environment that we see today. Um, we see that organisms are displaced because we have so many buildings coming up and houses coming up. And so the animals which normally would live in those environments now have to adapt to a new environment. Um, we normally fossil fuels, that carbon that I was talking about is locked under the ground and it's locked hundreds and hundreds of meters under the ground. It's not shallow. Um, the light, the, the pipelines, which go in to get that, that fossil fuel go very, very deep. And so normally in a normal ecosystem unperturbed by humans, that carbon would remain locked in the earth. But because we need that carbon to make energy, to run our cars, to make our computers, to make the plastics that we use every day, um, we've tapped into that fossil fuel, into that carbon, which is very buried very, very deep. Um, and that carbon is the carbon which is being released into the atmosphere today. And obviously, as the human population has grown, our demand for plastics, for cars, for transport, um, has increased. And so our demand for those fossil fuels and our demand for carbon to make the things that we use every day has increased. And that's why we see that humans have really started to kind of change the environment is because we're tapping into things which naturally wouldn't necessarily be kind of used um, by the environment in a normal, stable environment with a stable population. Mm. <laughs> so, so humans have changed because yeah. we've created um we've created cities and we've we tend to be kind of located in one small area and we we've just changed the kind of natural order of things the natural balance of things mm. um and so the impact that humans have had in a very small amount of time really we're talking you know a few thousand years um which geologically speaking as you said is but a few seconds in the earth's history um has really been significant um, compared to when we think about climatic change in the past, which I study, um, there we're talking about events which happened over hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. 
Mm. Um, and when we talk about human climate change and human perturbations on Earth today, as I said, we're really only talking about a few thousand years, which geologically speaking is nothing, but the impact is similar to what we see in deep time happened over 500,000 years. Mm. Um, so relatively speaking, the human impact on Earth today is, is really significant. Mm. So there have been changes over time um, in the climate, they were there were substantial changes, but it's just that they took a very long amount of time to have occurred in contrast to us, where it took us a very short amount of time to create that effect, if not more substantial, more har harmful. And how does that happen over time um, with the environment? How is, why did you know it take so something like five hundred thousand years to create some? Uh, change in the climate, how does that happen naturally? Yeah, so that's what geochemists study, basically. We study how these natural changes in the climate and the environment happened. Um, and this is, it's important for lots of reasons. One, it's important to understand modern climate change and how our environment is changing. It's important to understand this because if we want to start going to other planets, like Mars, for example, mm. those environments are very different to ours. So we mm. need to understand how we might be able to alter those environments as well and how mm. they might respond to alterations. Mm. But using geochemistry and using records of different types of elements from the periodic table, so it could be carbon, it could be boron, lithium, all, all these different elements give us clues about how the Earth has changed. But the change which happened in the past happened because of natural perturbation. So it happened because of changes in our environment big eruptive volcanism, so oh. volcanoes okay. which were erupting over a large scale yeah. as continents split apart. You know, the Earth today, when we think about the seven continents, hasn't always looked that way. At one point, those continents were all joined together. Mm. And through the processes of magma erupting, and I think most people have seen some film with volcanoes in it, yeah. <laughs> by that process of, of volcanoes erupting in, on the sea floor, those continents broke apart and that's huge volumes of magma. When we talk about volcanoes today, and we think about Hawaii or Indonesia or the Philippines or Japan, yeah. those volcanoes are relatively tiny compared to what we're talking about in deep time in the past. Mm. Um, and so these volcanoes put out large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, as well as dust particulates, um, nitrogen, uh, nitrous gases, sulfur gases, um, things which interfered in our atmosphere. Um, so just as an example of recent climate change related to similar things, um, in the 1980s, because of coal burning in Europe, there was a lot of sulfur being put into the atmosphere because as coal burns and it releases the energy from the breaking of the carbon and hydrogen in the coal, because coal is made of plants and plants much like us are made up of carbon, hydrogen and nitrogen. And as those things split apart, they, they release energy and that's how we get our energy in our homes. Um, but when we were burning a lot of coal in Europe um, and elsewhere in the world, and uh, coal is still burnt today in China and the US, a lot of sulfur was released. And they didn't use to put anything to stop that sulfur. And when that sulfur goes up into the atmosphere, it interacts with clouds and it forms acid rain. And that acid rain falls and it just is a change in the pH. So rainwater is normally about a pH of 6.8. And just as a point of reference, the water you drink is about seven. So it's a neutral pH. Mm. Um, that's the water you bathe in. You don't really interact with it very much. It doesn't have any impact on you. Mm. When water is acid, it can attack buildings. So it can, it can impact crops. Um, so plants can't tolerate this very acid rain that's falling. Um, buildings our mm. buildings, if they're made of certain types of rocks, they can start to break down, statues, and you can still see that damage today from that acid rain. Now, we're talking about only maybe a few tens of years that we had acid rain before they put these things called scrubbers into these coal-burning plants, which captured that sulfur and stopped it going into the atmosphere. But when we think about this in deep time, in geological time, you know, 200 thousand years ago when there was a lot of volcanoes going off in the Jurassic period, which is the period that I study the most, um, which is when dinosaurs really started to kind of take over on the planet, um, that acid rain would have lasted for hundreds of thousands of years, right? Mm. So if we start to compare that natural process and its impact on the environment, because it went on for so long, mm. it was so much more significant.
Mm. And again, those dust particulates which get released um, from volcanic activity, um, which we see in deep time, even today, um, when we recently had Ayafaya Jukul volcano went off in Iceland, that was in the early 2000s, uh, planes couldn't take off at Heathrow. Planes couldn't take off all over Europe because that volcanic glass and its little tiny pieces of dust and glass that come out of volcanoes gets thrown so high up into the atmosphere that actually it interferes with our normal aviation processes. Um, so if you imagine that you've got dust like that constantly going into the atmosphere over hundreds and thousands of years, that's going to have a huge impact environmentally because that dust, that, those glass particulates, they can reflect sunlight so they can make it much cooler on the planet. Um, they can also go into rain clouds and make them much heavier so they're forced to rain out. And they can it can just interfere with the natural ecological system. But those are natural processes and those processes they either instantaneous and they happen super, super quickly um, within days, right? So I fire Jekyll, when it went off, um, it affected aviation for about two weeks and a lot of planes were grounded in North America and Europe and elsewhere. Um, but in the geological past, when we think about these large volcanic areas, these we call them large igneous provinces, we're talking about volcanoes erupting violently for hundreds and thousands of years into the ecosystem and perturbing the ecosystem. And so the environment then has to respond to that. It has to come back to a normal level where life on earth is happy. There's not sulfur kicking around. There's not lots of carbon dioxide kicking around. And the plants like that carbon dioxide, right? So that's their food. Um, so plants and the oceans and the atmosphere will adjust themselves back to a background that's over hundreds of thousands of years or tens of thousands of years. And when we think about human perturbations of the environment, as I said, we're really talking about stuff which has happened just very recently. I mean, if you go back to the 1920s, very few people had cars compared to today where everybody has a car or takes a car or takes a train or takes some form of transport that relies on fuel, fossil fuels. Um, everybody has an iPhone. Everybody has a, not just an iPhone, but a phone or a computer. Um, and those are made of plastic. Um, and plastics come, are hydrocarbons. They come from the ground. Um, and so that has only really happened in the last 10, 20 years, those changes. And so that's really significant for the environment. Mm. Can we go back to talking about the Anthropocene? What, it, what is the Anthropocene? I know it's an epoch in geologic time. Uh, but what does it signify and what do these epochs uh, signify and what's so special about this last one that we you know, hear, hear this word so often? Yeah, so we have something called the geological time scale. And the geological time scale basically is the way that we as geologists and as scientists understand what's happened on Earth since the Earth was formed um, billions of years ago. And so through geological time, we have these events. And normally they're major, major events which saw drastic changes on Earth. Those could be mass extinctions, so complete wipeouts of species um, on the planet. Um, it could be a big change in plant life. So we know that plants start to take over um, in a period that we called the Carboniferous, and we call it the Carboniferous because carbon being from plants, <laughs> mm. um, and that's when land plants really took over on Earth. Um, and more recently we have this new time period which has been proposed, which is called the Anthropocene. Um, it's only recently been approved. Um, and the Anthropocene, really, scientists, what they're trying to say is that the impact of humans on the planet is so significant that it requires its own designation. It is different from what was happening before that. Um, so, for example, um, during the Second World War, when they started testing uh, nuclear weapons, that has a very, very specific marker on the planet. Okay, so you can go anywhere in the world and you can find a layer that tells you that they did that atomic testing. Um, and that's quite significant because that marks, if we go back, if we go, sorry, if we go forward in time, so if we go 100 years in time from now, we will still be able to look back and find that moment in time when they started testing nuclear weapons. Okay, so what scientists are saying is that humans in the last few thousand years have had such a significant impact 
and not even just a few thousand years, but really since the 1940s, our fingerprint on this planet is so significant that this time period requires its own designation, right? Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that we're special, <laughs> that, you know, humans have done something very, very unique. Um, we have done something unique. We've it's changed our awful. planet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've changed how we interact with our planet. But what scientists are saying is that in order for us to really study this period effectively, we have to recognize that it's different to the natural order of things, that we've changed things significantly. And so the Anthropocene was proposed um, probably about five, six years ago now. Um, and at the time, people were very concerned. And the reason they were concerned was because geologically speaking, when we talk about changes, we're talking about all of the dinosaurs going extinct, for example, right? Um, when we don't, we see organisms going extinct today, um, and it has been proposed that maybe we're coming into the sixth largest mass extinction that's ever happened on Earth. Um, but the problem is, because we're living in this period, a lot of scientists feel that, you know, you, you can't really name a period until you're out of it. Um, because traditionally in geology, we only study things which have happened already. Yeah, we don't study yeah. things which are happening now. Um, okay. But the Anthropocene is important for people to understand because the Anthropocene is for people. It is for the current generations to understand the impact that we as an organism living on this planet are having on this planet. Um, and so the Anthropocene is really about sea level rise, climate change. You know, Europe has just had one of the warmest summers ever on record. Um, you know, we see weather fluctuations here in the UAE. So we saw this year we had quite a lot of rain compared to past years and it was quite cloudy. And we don't normally see yeah. that it's cloudy yeah. in the middle of summer, right? Um, so we can start to see that there are changes happening in the environment. And so the Anthropocene really as it's being pushed forward. So there are commissions on this. There are groups of scientists who are experts in their field on specific time periods, and they form a subcommission. And that subcommission answers to an international body. And those scientists, they are the experts in their field, and they are responsible for making sure that people can understand why a time period exists. Mm, and so okay. for the Anthropocene, the big thing really is about modeling or looking into the future. So what have we done already? What damage have we done to the planet? How do we see that in the record, whether that's in the soil record or, you know, looking at where garbage goes, right? Because <laughs> our garbage isn't going anywhere. It just gets buried somewhere or oh, it gets yeah. locked out at sea. I think about that sometimes. <laughs> it's really haunting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, you know, it, th that is something, that, that is our fingerprint, right? That's our impact. Yeah, that's true. Um, and we will be able to see that in the future. Um, and so this commission of scientists for the Anthropocene, um, really they're responsible to see how we, we as a species are going to adapt and respond to climate change okay. and to changes on our planet. It's yeah. not just climate change. Um, you know, we've changed our local ecosystem. So we build skyscrapers and that changes the climate locally here, right? So we get yeah. microclimates. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever walked around the buildings here and it can be very windy between the buildings, yeah, but course, not sure. windy anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. So that's a microclimate. And, you know, by building these cities, we kind of change where heat gets trapped and we changed where it's cooled and, um, so, you know, the Anthropocene really is about studying that human impact. And, and so that will be very important for okay. us as okay. older generations and also for the next generations okay. to understand what they did. Awesome. Wow. I've got so many questions. Um, okay. So I want to know then, you know, we've, okay. First of all, I want to know we've manipulated the environment. We've manipulated the environment in ways that have had direct effects on our climate. Can we manipulate, well, these are bad effects for now that we've been speaking about, but can we manipulate the environment in a way where we're interacting with the resources but creating better effects? Is there a way, I mean, because we're talking about preservation sometimes, but also is there other ways that we can manipulate the environment where we can interact with resources to produce good effects in the climate? Yeah, and certainly you can see very good examples of that here in the UAE. Um, so for example, on the road, between Abu Dhabi and Dubai, you'll see all the trees that are planted. Those trees capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Okay. 
And so a good question is that by the UAE putting these trees there, which they're all no, la- native trees, right? Most of them are gaff trees, which are traditional trees. They've been here for thousands and thousands of years. Um, how much is that? How much are those trees helping to reduce our carbon emissions here in the UAE? Uh, the mangroves, the UAE has put a lot of money into the mangroves and restoring the mangroves. Um, and if you just drive in Abu Dhabi or on the road, in Sharjah, you'll see the mangroves are there. And mangroves are a really excellent trap for carbon dioxide, right? So, so we can have these projects, um, and many governments around the world have these projects that kind of um, try to enhance the environment um, and try to help the environment to become more sustainable for us as humans. Okay. Uh, mangroves do lots of things. They don't just store carbon. They also provide a habitat for a lot of organisms, um, flamingos, yeah. Turtle, all kinds of things, right? So yeah. if you have ever taken a kayak into the mangroves, you'll see there's lots of birds there and lots of organisms. Um, and so by supporting that ecosystem, we're helping the climate um, and we're also helping organisms. Um, you know, having buildings that are designed in ecological ways, um, and many buildings here in the UAE are, right? They're built with shading. Um, they're built with with water that's heated by solar energy, rather than by um, electricity. Um, and so all of those things start to offset our footprint on this planet. Mm. Um, there's lots of things that we can do, right, as, mm. an, as a nation, right? We could use all of our food waste to produce energy, and countries like Turkey and Sweden already do that. Um, and that doesn't necessarily impact the climate, but it kind of reduces our waste footprint, Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, in terms of changing the climate, you know, yeah, it's more a tricky like question, repairing right? the environment. Yeah. Does that work? Is that so? A- we, I mean, we have seen, like, for example, the ozone hole, yeah. which used to be over Australia, and you know, there's little bits of holes in the ozone here, there, and everywhere have been healed, um, and that's largely because of efforts to minimize um, the types of pollutants which go into the environment and um, minimize. Um, the an, an increase basically forestation which okay. can then help produce okay. more ozone okay. oxygen but that sounds like to me that we're just taking preventative measures and the yeah. climate just heals on its own it's not like we are making any kind of direct um effort into well not effort but we're not directly manipulating the environment it's kind of like it does it, it does that on its own yeah and then yeah. we have to help it along we have to just facilitate it yeah yeah and and that's the, the problem though is that when we talk about fixing climate change, right, we're talking about instantaneous fixes. So everybody stop driving tomorrow. Well, that's not yeah. going to happen, right? And okay. also, if everybody stopped driving tomorrow, yeah, CO two is the carbon dioxide is not going to be reduced in the atmosphere. Yeah, because it's not just carbon dioxide. We only talk about carbon dioxide, but a big problem for climate change is also water vapor, and a lot of industrial processes produce water vapor. Water vapor humidity effectively, is really good at trapping heat. And anybody who's been out in the UAE in the last two weeks when it's been 80% humid mm. knows this very well, right? Mm. You go out, you feel cool. Okay. And although it's only 31 degrees outside, it's so humid that you suddenly feel really hot. Yeah. Okay. So water vapor and methane, which is carbon and hydrogen, these are natural gases as well. And they also enhance climate change. They also increase the temperature. So it's not just about solving carbon dioxide. We can pull down carbon dioxide. I mean, there are lots of experiments looking at drawing down carbon dioxide, storing carbon dioxide underground, in sandstone, um, you know, pulling carbon dioxide down, increasing forests, um, increasing mangroves, all of these types of things. But we still have to address the other gases as well. And the thing is that addressing those is taking long-term measures. So long-term measures to improve, you know, our cars, right? So yeah, okay, you can switch to a Tesla today <laughs> or some other hybrid electric vehicle. Um, but, you know, that that's not going to change the environment today. You, yeah. you getting in an electric car today might have an impact in 100 or 500 years. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we're talking about one person on a planet of, you know, 7.8 billion people or whatever it is, right? Yeah, who's got tens of of thousands of dollars to drop. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, 
And I mean, also our food supply, our food supply is very, very carbon and water intensive. So yeah, we could all stop eating beef, but beef also has a good impact on the environment. Um, We could all stop eating soy or corn, but most people don't realize that their cheap primary food is actually made from those things. Rice, everybody in the UAE or most people in the UAE have rice at least one meal a day. Yeah. Rice paddies in Asia release methane into the environment. And rice is a very, very cheap, sustainable food source. Yeah. Right? So poorer countries, they generally have rice as one of their primary carbohydrates. Well, rice paddies are extremely bad for the environment. Okay, if we chop them all down, we get rid of them. Yeah, we're going to reduce the the methane going into the atmosphere. And methane, when it goes into the atmosphere, it has a very, very short life cycle. So... But that life cycle is still, you know, four to 10 years, right? So, okay, everybody can stop eating rice tomorrow, but we're still going to have to wait almost a decade to see how the environment is going to respond to that. And the biggest risk that we take is that we do something to reduce our carbon footprint or our water footprint or our methane footprint, and we perturb a different system. So. You know, the planet really, it's a series of interrelated systems. So it's the hydrological cycle, how water interacts. It's the climate cycle. um, It's the ecosystem's biological cycle, the nitrogen cycle. All these different cycles work together. And the problem is that they work together quite harmoniously. And as we start to change, as we have changed our habits, we've started to disrupt those cycles. So we've disrupted the water cycle We've disrupted the oceans. That's why we see sea level rise. And the problem is we might take actions without knowing what the impact will be on one of the other systems. Okay. Right. Yeah. So if we drain all the rice paddies, those are normally created in natural wetlands. Yeah. So then we're draining natural wetlands, which are the habitats for lots of birds and other organisms. Oh, there's a huge opportunity cost. Yeah. So I think we have to be very careful. Yes, we should all take measures to reduce our carbon footprint, right? So if you buy a flight and it says to you, would you like to offset your carbon footprint? Say yes. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Uh, When you go to the supermarket, think about what you're buying. Is the dish soap that you're using, does it contain sulfides, right? Mm. Everybody buys shampoo and conditioner and they see on it, it says no sulfates. Most people don't know why they care if it has sulfates in it. Well, the reason they care is because it affects organisms which live in the water. It deteriorates their skin. Yeah, yeah. Um, So those things, people should do them. Um, But in terms of large-scale measures to perturb the climate or to try and restore the climate, I think it's... um, We really have to be very, very careful because then we're starting to manipulate even further something that we've already Mm. manipulated. Yeah, I understand. So I got a two-part question for you related to this. What is, I mean, because, I mean, this is a question that most people think about when they talk about climate change. What can I do different, right? But then you hear so many other people say, well, I mean, they could have reason to think this, really. I'm just one person. Like you said earlier, I'm just one person. What am I going to do that's going to change the 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 way the, er, the the sort of the path we're all taking? It's kind of inevitable. It's kind of deterministic, right? That we all feel a little deterministic about this. So you hear a lot of climate scientists instead say, right? Um, it's more at the institutional level. It's more at the large scale level. We need to make sure that we are pushing for these changes because even though you're one person, you need to make sure that it's a collaborate collaborative effort. What do you think about this? How would you weigh in on this uh, in terms of, I, I know it's maybe a little bit of a, like a false dichotomy about the individual versus the collective. So I'm curious about that, but also I wonder how that feeds into something else, which is about preventative measures versus corrective measures. So it sounds to me like preventative measures are substantially more effective at making sure we are heading in the right direction. So how, how would you weigh in on this? Yeah, so I get asked this question a lot. What can I do? (laughs) Yeah, of course. Um, And as I said, I think think that all of the little changes that you can take, right? So taking your own bags to the grocery store, 
doesn't sound like a big deal, right? But if that's the one thing that you do, you are reducing how much plastic ends up in the oceans. You're reducing plastic, which didn't need to be made in the first place, right? And plastic is made from carbon. Um, As we've just said, carbon is good. We need it. But carbon is also bad when it ends up in the atmosphere and there's not enough plants to pull it down. Um, And so I think you have to ask yourself, Yes, okay, we need institutions to put into place policies Mm. and to support the future of the planet, right? So we need our governments, um, and we know like the UAE was the first country to sign the Paris Accord, which is about climate change. Mm -hmm. So we we need countries to invest in the future. And to invest in the future, they have to invest in looking at climate change, basically. Um, And so, yes, we need that. But the thing is that, Those policies don't mean anything if you as the individual don't take any action, right? So if the government puts in a policy which says, you know, we're going to start charging you two dirhams to use a plastic bag, the idea is to stop you from using a plastic bag, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The idea is to encourage you to take your own bags to the supermarket. Yeah. The thing is, everybody could say, well, I don't care. I have two dirhams, so I'm just going to... Buy the plastic mm-hmm. bags, yeah, right? Yeah. So people have to understand what their actions are doing, right? So mm. what is the repercussion of you having, you know, 15 plastic bags for 15 items from the grocery store? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Where do those plastic bags go? Mm-mm. Where do they end up? Most people, while well, they use them again, maybe they use them in a bin, but then that plastic bag ends up in a rubbish dump somewhere and it's not going to get broken down just, or it gets blown out to sea or whatever. Okay. Okay, Yeah. So yes, we need institutions to put policies in place, Mm. but we as individuals need to take actions. We need to educate ourselves on those policies and why our governments are taking those policies. Yeah. We have to understand why do entities exist? Why does the ministry of climate change and environment exist? Why did the UAE government think that was important? Yeah. Right. And it's a big entity. It's not a small entity. Mm. And, you know, it has a lot of scientists working for it. Um, They're not just there as a figurehead. They're there to help enforce laws which encourage us as a nation to improve how we interact with the environment. So we as individuals, we should take measures, no matter how small they are in our daily life. I mean, it's difficult for us to stop driving. It's very hard to get anywhere um, especially like in Abu Dhabi, you know, the bus take hours, right? So if I'm in a yeah, rush, yeah. it's much easier for me to take my car. Um, so, okay, yeah, I'm taking one action, which is bad, which is driving my car everywhere. But then there has to be a balance and I have to, as an individual, try and offset that by doing other things, by not using plastic bags, by okay. not using sulfates, which could impact the environment, by having more plants in my home or on my balcony, by planting native trees, um, by creating um, a safe environment, right? By picking up trash after myself, um, making sure it goes in the right place, um, investing in things like district cooling. You know, dif- district cooling ecologically is a really good thing. And we have it in Dubai, we have it in Abu Dhabi. And basically this is where rather than you having a single AC unit, which is energy intensive in every room in your house, mm. your building along with all of the other buildings in your neighborhood get their air conditioning from one single source. Okay, that's district cooling. And the thing is that initially district cooling is very expensive. So you as the individual, you might say, I I can't afford this right now. But in the long term, the environmental impact of buying into that district cooling or buying into that ecological measure for your home is going to be significant. Putting solar panels on your house today, yeah, it's going to be really expensive. But down the line, maybe you're going to offset a huge electricity bill right? Maybe you're going to feed energy into the power grid, right? So you're making a positive contribution to society as an individual. And it Mm. might not be today. It might be in 10 years or it might be in 20 years, Mm. but better to start training yourself now Mm. (laughs) than to end Mm. up one day going to the grocery store and there are no plastic bags because the government said, well, the two Durham idea didn't work. Everybody's still using plastic bags. No more plastic bags. Yeah, I Which understand. Which could happen. Yeah. Okay. So I think, yeah, the institution the institution is taking measures. Yeah. And it's taking measures based on scientific advice. 
But that doesn't matter if we as individuals don't take action ourselves. Yeah, understandable. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope, so I hope I answered your question. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> no, I think that's a really important question. I've been thinking about this for a long time. And I have been trying to take personally some measures here and there to try and recycle and, you know, carry this annoying water bottle that everybody always complains about, the one that makes all these noises in class. Just, you know, all these really small measures that I think are really important. But I've seen documentaries before where I talked about this. I asked someone else about this previously. You can do all of that and then take one plane ride somewhere else. And the amount of harm you do to the environment by just taking one plane ride somewhere else um, is incredible. Because I've seen a documentary before where there was a house, uh, a household where women uh, and, and the, the, peop- the members of the family have been um, recycling absolutely everything and using reusable diapers and just taking some really <laughs> insane measures. But I, I completely understand why. But you can see how difficult it is to use a reusable diaper, right? But if you've got, you're that committed to the environment, and then they show you um, in this document, I saw how, just how little, um, uh, sort of how, how, how much they've just decreased the harm that they have been um, sort of... Um, you know the yeah, harm that yeah, their yeah basically, basically yeah basically but yeah. then they show you um graphs of what it looks like in comparison to all the effort they're that they're committing to this and then taking a plane ride so well i think uh, i think you just have to educate yourself yeah. and i think i mean there are websites you can go and calculate your carbon footprint um and there's many of them just type in carbon footprint calculator <laughs> and they'll come up um, like calories. <laughs> yeah, basically. And it tells you how many trees or whatever you need to plant to offset your carbon footprint. Yeah. Right? So you can do that. Yeah. If you're going to take, you know, 15 plane rides in a year. <laughs> um, an interesting juxtaposition of things is that people who work on climate change at a political level have to go to lots of international meetings. <laughs> So they have to fly to these meetings to fight climate change, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's always kind of a funny thing. Um, but I think, you know, technology is getting a lot better. Mm. And yeah, we all like to go on vacation. And so, you know, I think you have to do what's reasonable for you. Um, and so take that plane ride, but, you know, invest mm-hmm. in carbon offset somehow yeah. right yeah i understand and I be understand. smart yeah. about it like yeah. i think the thing that people what what I, I hope people don't think is that by somehow changing something in their life because of um climate change and because of environmental change that they are somehow making their life worse right yeah what 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 we want as scientists, and I think what governments want, is that people just act responsibly. Mm. So enjoy your life. <laughs> yeah. But the next time that you get in your car to drive to the mosque, which is a five-minute walk away, and it probably took you 10 minutes to drive there and park and get out of your car, yeah. just walk there. Yeah. Yeah, it's hot, but, you know, it's a five-minute walk. Yeah, I understand. Okay? Yeah. So it's just really those little things. And yeah. I think... Don't if it diminishes your quality of life, ask yourself, well, is it worth it? Yeah. Um, for me to take this plane ride yeah. to Disneyland where I'm gonna have a great time. And yeah. the answer's probably yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, but then on the other hand, just think, well, okay, I'm gonna take these actions for the rest of the year to try and improve that. Um, and I think different people feel differently about it. I mean, there's still a lot of people who don't think climate change is significant and don't think that we're really harming the environment and just carry on business as usual. So I always tried to think to myself, well, whatever actions I take, (laughs) I'm offsetting those people too, right? Okay. For those people, what are some markers in the environment? Like you mentioned humidity. What are some other markers in the environment that that you think they, that would help them uh, notice that there have been some changes? So what are some examples of that? Or do you think the the traces of environmental change or climate change um, are less noticeable and probably more um, e- sort of uh, more accessible to scientists as opposed to someone who just... Yeah, so I think day? it's kind of... That's a difficult question because people who don't believe in climate change and don't believe in environmental change and don't think humans are impacting the planet, 
it's not because they're not educated, right? They see the news. Um, they have probably had lessons in high school or in school yeah. about the environment. Yeah. Um, and so for those people, it's um, at their very core, maybe they care, but they just don't think it's that significant. Yeah. And it's very hard to convince those people otherwise unless yeah. they have a firsthand experience of something really drastic. Like a right? closer... Um, yeah dying. but I mean how many people <laughs> going to funeral for one of those yeah. yeah how many people are gonna you know witness a glacier melting yeah. in their lifetime right and yeah. maybe some people might enjoy which with, with witnessing glaciers collapsing into the oceans yeah. right maybe that's fun for them oh no um but I think for those people it's just gonna take time mm. and I think if they see that ac governments are taking more actions then they will eventually have to recognize that this is something that they have to do. Yeah, yeah. This more this goes into the area of psychology and I yeah. think attitudinal change and how to yeah. change people's minds uh, with respect to, for example, their. Yeah. Um, and I think I mean you guys are uh, yeah. you 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 know you're much younger than I am, yeah. <laughs> and I suspect that you've had a lot more education on the environment and climate change than I did in school. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and the next generation below you and even younger. Um, they see it every day. Yeah. It's in their cartoons. It's in, and so that is going to have a long-term impact on those people. Yeah. And so I think it's just time. Mm. Um, and also a lot of people who don't care, there's not much we can do to make them care. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you mentioned something cool earlier that I wanted to ask about. Um, well, cool, very tragic. I guess that's pretty subjective. Mass extinctions <laughs> can be pretty tragic. Um, you said we were approaching what could be our sixth mass extinction can you talk about any of the earlier mass extinctions i'm sure there yeah, are dinosaurs so, and what else exactly so dinosaurs went extinct at the end of the cretaceous um so about 82 million years ago or thereabouts maybe 78 i don't know i don't work on dinosaurs very yeah. much okay but, <laughs> yeah all right um but so basically all at a single point in time all of the dinosaurs were wiped out on earth right so this is one of the major mass extinction events um, even earlier than that, we have big mass extinctions, uh, for example, of the um, tetrapods, which is at the end of the Permian. And so there was large volcanism. And again, it created all these acid gases and it wiped out these creatures, which sort of look like friendly alligators, maybe the only alligator. way that I can describe them. <laughs> um, so if you look up the Permian and Permian environments, you yeah. can learn about them. Um, but, you know, in the geological time scale, we've had lots of instances of whole um, arrays of animals just go, being wiped out completely. Um, those could be soft-bodied organisms. Um, it could be things like giant sea scorpions, which can be, you know, um, up to a meter long or two meters long, eurypterids. Ah. Um, and so these things just went completely extinct because of a major, major environmental perturbation. So the ecosystem could no longer support them. And certainly with dinosaurs, we know that dinosaurs, they're so huge, right? So ecologically, they're not very sustainable and they just got kept getting bigger and bigger. And so as a, as a species, they started to decline effectively. I mean, we still have dinosaurs around today in the form of chickens and lizards and things like that, right? Chickens are effectively tiny little dinosaurs, <laughs> right? Um, and so they're a type of dinosaur. Those are the feathered dinosaurs, the flying yeah. dinosaurs, which are birds today. Um, and so, but this mass extinction event, these mass extinction events that we have in deep time, um, they're really, really huge. And so when we look globally, we can see evidence of them everywhere. Um, to name all of them would be difficult because <laughs> each of them is a slightly different mechanism. Yeah, yeah, I understand, yeah. Um, yeah. There are some very good articles on are we entering the sixth next biggest extinction? Um, and it's because the rate at which we see organisms disappearing on Earth today is really rapid. Um, so I think it's something like every day, like a species disappears or something like that. I mean, I'm sure somebody can look up those statistics. Okay. I don't know, yeah. but it's very, very rapid. Um, I don't know if anybody saw, but like last year, the last wild white rhino was killed. Um, that's the last white 
wild white rhino. There are none left. W- would that right? would that um, fall under climate change, or would that fall under other kinds? Well, it's of... anthropological change. It's which anthropological is a big change, word, yeah, right? Yeah, which yeah. just means it's induced by right. people. Yeah, by people. And a lot of the times, it's people encroaching on the habitats of organisms. Exactly. Right. So, so it's other ways of just disturbing their environment. Yeah. So it's not necessarily or directly killing them. I think. Yeah. It's not necessarily them. environmental change. I mean. You know, we know the dodos, for example, were hunted to death. They were too friendly yeah. and too stupid to run away, so yeah. they were all killed. Yeah. Right? Um, so no dodos. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, right. I read an article recently about sloths and pandas and koalas and these kind of slow-moving bears that they just can't keep up to move within their environment, and so they are slowly going extinct, right? Though pandas Be- have had a, bit- a very good yeah. breeding you know, within captivity. Is it because of us mainly? They can't outrun yeah, us? Yeah, it is. It's is because that... we're encroaching on their environments. And so we are building more and more into their natural environments. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, if you think, you know, we are building more and more into the desert, what animals live in the desert? Well, it's not just, you know, gazelles or lobbies or, you know, the animals that we think of. There are lots of animals that live in the desert. Yeah. Right? Different kinds of birds, different kinds of lizards, different kinds of rodents. And every time we build somewhere, we kind of perturb them. Yeah. Right. And there's a domino effect. So it may not be necessarily that we're harming, they're harming X animal, yeah. but we could be harming an animal that is related yeah, to this exactly. animal in some way in the ecosystem. Yeah. And that could create that kind of effect. And so there is this discussion that we are entering the sixth largest mass extinction on earth. Um, some scientists agree, some don't agree because they just say, well, that's the natural order of things. And it's not actually, you know, if we look holistically at how many animals are left, well, there's a lot, right? It's not a tiny amount. And we keep finding, we we haven't actually really studied the whole planet. There are still species to be discovered, yeah, right? Yeah. Very, very deep oceans, which yeah. we can't access, yeah. remote locations that we can't get to. Um, you know, we're still discovering things. So if we're still discovering things, can we really say we're entering a period where everything is dying, right? We don't know. Also, we know that some organisms really like warm planet. So it could be that we're actually increasing the numbers of different types of animals that like it being hot. And those animals might spread out. So again, are we really causing mass extinction? Um... And so this is, it's, I wouldn't say it's a hot topic, but it, I mean, it just falls within the kind of discussion of what is the human impact on earth um, relative to kind of natural destruction of organisms, right? So the dinosaurs disappearing because of a meteorite and volcanism and environmental change, or I think everybody's seen Ice Age, right? So mm-hmm. um, Ice Age has all these creatures which love the cold, right? Woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers, and they all went extinct, because the planet got warmer. Um, and so that is, a, it's, a, it's a mass extinction. It's not one of the biggest mass extinctions on Earth, right? So we do have extinctions through time. And what makes it a massive mass extinction compared to just a minor extinction event, which we have many, many minor extinction events, because organisms go extinct. That's just the natural order of things. Um, that's a complicated question. And I don't know that we, until somebody officially declares that we are in the sixth biggest mass extinction, which probably won't be me, <laughs> then I don't know that we yeah. can really say much about yeah. it. Yeah. But I'm sure that doesn't take away from the moral imperative of human beings to preserve environments for yeah. creatures that are already alive. Yeah. And, you know, not an excuse for us to say, well, you know, they may die, but others kind of like it. Yeah, you know, yeah. Sorry, no, that's guess, right. Yeah, and yeah. I think, I mean, certainly the white rhino is probably one of the saddest stories, I think, because yeah, they were true. effectively yeah. hunted in the 20th and 21st yeah. century yeah, into absolutely. extinction. Yeah, no. um, and that could have been prevented. Yeah, yeah right? thank you. That was a very insightful yeah. answer. Um, so I like to ask this question as well about um, what sort of misconceptions people ha- have about your field and how do you interact with, uh, how do you deal with these misconceptions? Yeah, so um, the big... <laughs> There are lots of misconceptions about geology. Um, when I was an undergraduate, it was that it was rocks for jocks, jocks being people who like sports. So it was the easy science, which was for people who wanted to do a science degree, but weren't smart enough to do something else, oh, no. <laughs> like chemistry or biology. Okay. Or um, And one of the big misconceptions here is that being a geologist is not as good as being an engineer. 
Um, <laughs> okay. And that's great. Engineers are good. We need engineers. <laughs> uh, but we always also need geologists because unfortunately engineers have to, if they're going to build something, if they're going to drill something, if they're going to change the landscape somehow, they need people who understand the earth. So they need the geologists to do whatever destructive or constructive thing that they do, Yeah. right? Um, when we talk about missions to Mars or missions to other planets, those missions are to study those planets. Now, the people who design and engineer the crafts which go on those missions, yes, those are engineers. The data they collect, however, is geological data. And so geologists are really important. Um, and I think the big misconception is that they're not, that we don't need them, they're not relevant. Um, but we live on this planet. And so having people who understand this planet <laughs> You'd think is that. kind <laughs> of a critical thing. Um, and geology has done a very good job of evolving. It's a very rapidly evolving subject and it's very interdisciplinary, right? Um, so geologists quite often interact with biologists, with chemists, with physicists, with engineers, with all different kinds of people, uh, mathematicians. I mean, you know, you name it and then geologists will interact with it. Um, and the reason for that is because in order for us to continue to exist as a subject, we have to be relatable to the public, right? This not, geology is not just about dinosaurs or you know, mountains, right? It's about much deeper things than that. And um, it is a historic subject. It is interdisciplinary. It, it draws on all of the other subjects, which is why it doesn't get a Nobel Prize because it's not a pure subject. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, you know, it, it's not boring, <laughs> It's very interesting. Least, yeah. um, you don't have to memorize everything. In fact, I don't think I've ever memorized anything in my life, um, which that's a common misconception from undergraduates. <laughs> it's not easy. A lot of undergraduates come in and say like, ah, oh, well, you know, I quit chemical engineering. I'm going to do geology because it's easy. Wow. And then they make, they have a lot of regrets about that when they realize they have to take calculus three um, or some There's other There's so many subject. tables though. <laughs> Whenever I open Wikipedia on some area related to geology, I see so many tables with so many technical names. It makes me feel like yeah, I need well, to memorize. Geology has its own language. Yeah, of course it does. Um, yeah. But you know, if you learn Latin, then that language is really easy. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's a prerequisite. <laughs> or, or Greek. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I mean, all subjects have their own technical languages, yeah. but I think pe people just think geology is, because it's an integrated subject, yeah. it's kind of a worthless subject. Yeah. But it isn't because we live on this planet, right? Yeah. So it's super critical for us. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, just to get... You know, I feel like we're, we're just getting started, to be honest. There are so many other things we could talk about that's related to this. And, and you brought a lot of insight into just how important it is for us to talking about this earth and our, how critical our role here is being on this earth, being responsible, being considerate of our environment and our climate and other creatures that are on this earth with us too and having some respect for them. So it really is a really important subject to talk about. And I feel like we're just getting started. But uh, before we go, I really want to ask you, um, what are some resources that we can provide to the public um, for them to start looking into this for when they're curious? Where do they go? Yeah, so, well, one, be careful what you read <laughs> because some yeah. sources are not created equal. I do think... Um, David Attenborough, there was a series on, it was on Netflix. I'm sure it's on Amazon Prime. I'm sure it's downloadable um, about our planet Earth. Yeah. Um, and I strongly recommend that people watch that as if, you, if you're not a big fan of uh, reading. Um, if you like reading, there's the International Panel on Climate Change Reports, which are written by the general public. Um, and I'll give you guys the link. You can Maybe link that in the podcast at the bottom. Yeah. Um, and that report is written by a panel of scientists who have been working on climate change for a long time um, and they're experts in the field. Um, the United Nations also has lots of videos on their website um, related to humans and how humans are impacted by climate change, by sea level rise, um, by what's happening to our planet. Um, and they have reports on that and they talk about those reports country by country and yeah. again those are written for the general public they're not written for you know specialists they're written for policy makers who want to read it quickly mm -hmm. um, and they're written for the general public and they usually have videos that go with them um, so if you're a teacher those are great resources to have um, but I mean there are lots and lots of resources online about climate change um, about what you can do 
um, to help the environment, to help climate. Um, and people are always free to email me if they have questions. I may not be able to answer them, but I'm on the Khalifa University website and I'm always happy to <laughs> send you a link. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Thank yeah. you so much, Dr. Aisha, for being on the show. It was really great talking to you and thank you for giving us your time. Yeah, you're more than welcome. And hopefully I'll come back. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about geology more. Yeah. yeah. That was Dr. Aisha es Professor of Earth Sciences at Khalifa University. To listen to more episodes, you can find Good Question on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for what you'd like to see from us next, you can reach us at goodquestionuae on Instagram and Twitter, or email us at info at goodquestion.ae. Good Question is a production of the Youth Science Council and the Office of Advanced Sciences in the United Arab Emirates. Produced and directed by Hind Ali and Hayat Al Hassan. Sound designed by Gareth Chen. Saad Al Ali is our editor. Hamad Al Mansouri is our digital media coordinator. And I'm Sada Shibaji. Mm-hmm.